Okay, we have a motion. Okay, I'd like to call the meeting of uh, the Rio CAC to order. Uh, David, could you read the uh, Zoom notice for the last time, probably? Yes, sir. And, and take attendance, too. Okay, yeah. yes. Um, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID disaster. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are Tom Paoletti, Marty Meth, Rick Seaman, Lee Condor, Todd Cohn, Chris Becker, and Brian McMillan. I think, I think I got them all. That is correct. And, and just to note that Judy, Marty Davis, and Nicole have let me know that uh, they couldn't attend, so they're ex marked as excused. And Peter should be joining in a couple of minutes if you can figure out how to get online. And, and one last, like, and one last sentence. is going to be coming on too. Okay. One last sentence the opportunity for the public to access and participate in the electronic meeting are posted on the Avalon County calendar and on the meeting agenda. Okay. Okay. So I just like to uh, just see if anybody will make a motion, a motion to approve the minutes. The last minutes were in May. I sent them out to everybody. Can somebody yeah. have, have any comments? Yes. I move approval of the minutes. Thank you. Do I have a second? Are these seconds it? So all in favor, raise your hands. Thank you. It's approved. Okay, so the next item on our agenda is a community meeting, the City Church Multi-Use Space Edition. I'm going to turn that over to Rebecca Ragsdale. Uh, I believe I uh, should handle it. And then will you introduce who are with you on, on this and then after we finish, we'll open it up to any of the attendees to see if they, and panelists, and obviously the CAC members, see if they have questions. So Rebecca, it's yours now. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Rebecca Ragsdale. I'm a planning manager um, for development review projects um, for community development, and that includes special use permits, site plans, rezonings, and um, special use permits. Um, just gonna give a brief presentation um, you know, we like to cover our community meetings, a little bit of education about the process, and then just introduce you to um, what the project is and some of the basics in terms of planning and zoning before we turn it over to the applicants to give you the details of the project and, and tell you about City Church. And they're, they're represented by Craig Katarski of Timmins. And then we have um, Chris Becker from the church here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um and run through um the presentation and if you could just let me know that the slide show is sharing is that it is thank you i just want to make sure um you know we are going back to in person so the planning commission is is in person um so you know, the purpose of the, of the meeting, as I said, is just, you know, an introduction to the what the proposal is and making sure people understand the county process and the project details and allowing for um, community uh, members, neighbors, people that live nearby the project to answer, to ask any questions. And um, if anyone has anything that they want to contact me about as the lead reviewer, my um, contact information is on the screen and I can share that with whoever. Um, so we usually start with a little bit about the the process. You know, the county has a number of processes people would need to go through before they could, you know, develop something on their property. And um, this is, you know, a special use permit is what we refer to as the legislative process and the legislative action that's needed. Only the Board of Supervisors can approve special use permits. Um, so we're at the very beginning of the process. Um, this property has a history of special use permits. One was approved most recently in 2018. So this is um, an amendment that you'll learn about in terms of um, what the what the new proposal is for the site. So that would get um, you know staff level review, other agency reviews, um, 
and comments from staff before it would then go to the commission for the commission to review and take action on. And then the next stop would be the board of supervisors. Now, after that is the whole is the rest of the process where um, the detailed engineering site plan would need to be developed uh, and reviewed. And then this, this site is subject to ARB review before they could then get building permits and, and begin, begin construction. So I'm sure the CAC has seen this slide many times, but we always include this um, these sort of uh, process reminders for anyone from the public that might not have um, been to a community meeting before or be familiar with this terminology or this process. Um, the special use permit process is for um, uses that we think may be appropriate in a residential area, but but may not always be appropriate at certain sites. And it's an opportunity for look for us to look at um, the use, the size, you know, what the use is, what the impacts to neighbors would be, or traffic impacts, and review it for consistency with the comprehensive plan. And this is a site where that review has been done a few times, and there are some um, conditions of approval associated with the site um, that are intended to address that. And you know, we, we want to make sure that um, you know, there's no impacts to the residential neighbors in the area and that sort of thing for this particular site. Um, so jumping, jumping to the site itself, I believe everyone's pretty familiar with it if you live in this area. It's across from Belvedere Boulevard and right beside K-Tech um, and right on the city county line. So it's that triangular um, pie-shaped parcel on um, Raya Road. So this is to amend the prior special use permit um, to add a new building and expand the parking lot. And I'm gonna, you know, I have in my slides, I'm not sure if Craig and I'll have any redundant slides, but um, just a brief, brief look at that. Um, I mentioned it's a residential area. That's what the yellow is on the map. This is our zoning map. Um, and everything in yellow is residential. You can see the city over to the left across the railroad tracks. And then across the street is the other church that zone commercial, and then the dark green is um, neighborhood model, which is also primarily um, that site primarily approved for residential uses. This is your um, Places 29 master plan. Um, the orange is um, residential areas, urban density residential designation, and then the uh, blue is institutional for KTEC. Um, we find in, in our master plans that um, that we, we recognize the need for uses, um, secondary uses, supportive uses to residential areas such as churches and schools. So it is a use that um, has already been approved on this site. Uh, they just need some more building expansion or some more, some more space. So I mentioned the previously approved plan. Um, this was a special use permit amendment in 2018. So the special use permit was approved, but they haven't pursued any additional approvals. And this was a more, significant redevelopment of the site and a new building and a new parking and I believe even structured parking and a new entrance. But this is the new plan, um, which Craig will go into a great bit of detail about, I'm sure, um, but it includes the existing building remaining and then a new proposed building, which would be a multi-purpose building um, with parking being added around or at the edges of existing parking lots. So it would be behind um, the existing church there um, Raya Road, Warner Parkway to your right, um, and then the railroad tracks to the left in terms of the triangle, and KTEC to the um, to the south. So again, the purpose of my presentation is just to make sure everyone knows sort of the framework, what type of review this is, what the process is. It is at the very beginning of the review. Um, so staff reviews the proposal and we provide written comments. Um, and then this community meeting got scheduled a little later in the process, so we haven't completed all of our comments to the applicant. Um, so at, at a certain point, and then and um, it would be scheduled for the planning commission public hearing, and then the board of supervisors public hearing to ultimately make a decision on the application. Um, so then my contact information again. Um, so if anyone, I don't know if anyone has any questions, you want to just go over to Craig now. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And I will uh, start sharing my screen. How about does okay. that work? Sounds good. <laughs> um, and the one thing, uh, Rebecca, as you just asked, K 
can you guys verify that the right screen is showing because Yes, you always get yes. the one where it'll show the preview and I've never figured out how to make it work for me every time out of the gate, except to just ask. Um, so anyways, um, thank you everyone for having us. I'm Craig Katarski. I am a principal at Timmins Group. We are primarily a civil engineering firm. Um, I have met with you guys before, usually in a supporting role, um, but am sort of leading the charge for the applicant city church. And I'm joined by Chris Becker, who is uh, the operations pastor at City Church. And what I, I have a quick presentation that I want to go through, but what I was going to ask Chris to do first was to give you all a little bit of an understanding of the why behind uh, this request for the special use permit, the why behind the, the need to, to build this addition to the building. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris and let him let him talk a little bit. There we go. Thank you, Craig. Um, yeah, I'm Chris Becker. I've been the operations pastor for 18 years at City Church, and uh, City Church has been a community member since uh, for 80 years now. And uh, we did have the prior SUP, um, but as COVID hit, it was kind of solidified that we needed to go back to our main facility because we were meeting at Charlottesville High School. And so that became our home base of operations for Sunday services. And so with that, we kind of looked at what our needs were after COVID hit. And what our needs were, were for uh, kids space and offices. Well, our offices were in the basement of the facility, so we switched that all over to kids, but we still didn't have enough room for kids. And so we moved over and we utilized Covenant's Gymnasium for part of our kids on each and, Sunday morning. Uh, Audrey? So uh, with using Covenant's gym, it kind of put an idea in our head is that we don't need the other facility that we had proposed previously, but the gym uh, on our site would work out quite well, as well with the addition of some office space. So that's kind of why we've adjusted what we've been looking for. Um, and so that's where we're kind of heading and looking to add some additional parking. Um, the facility on Sunday mornings, the kids over at Covenant would now be meeting over on our site. Uh, so it would eliminate traffic flow going from City Church over to Covenant Church. So that would eliminate that process. And so uh, it would just kind of keep us all consolidated on our side of the street and uh, utilize the facility quite well and meet all of our needs. The other thing is it would add some additional office space since we took it away from the basement level for our staff. And the final thing is uh, each Sunday night our uh, kids, our youth program meets in the sanctuary. So that's kind of a, a different place to have our youth group. So uh, we'd love to have a gymnasium and some open space for them. And then with that, it's uh, having another gym. We've heard that in the community, there's uh, not too many gym spaces. So it'd be something that throughout uh, you know, the month, there might be some community members uh, and groups that might be able to use utilize that as well. So that's kind of why we're looking to uh, kind of switch from the prior SUP to this SUP with just the gymnasium and some office space and a kitchen. Great. And um... Thanks, Chris. And and then a little bit more about the the what exactly that we're proposing. And Rebecca kind of touched a little bit on this already, but the the addition would be, and I'll and I'll show some images here in a second that show um, where it is. But I know Rebecca flashed them up before us previously. But the addition will be about ten thousand six hundred square feet. It would be located sort of towards the rear of the site, um, and it would include additional parking spaces. Um, and as has been noted, there was a special use permit granted a few years ago. Um, and then I think the one key also is that there are no additional seats that are being proposed um, within the sanctuary. So from a bird's eye view, this is the site you can see K-Tech, uh, you can see K-Tech to the south and you see Ryo John Warner um, kind of passing in front of it. And the parking lot that you see that is on the north side of Ryo that's that's the Covenant Church that Chris was um, noting that is currently their gym is being used for kids activities for City Church. So if you think about it, if you have children, um, you are actually pulling into the Covenant Church off down Belvedere and then uh, dropping your kids off, coming across the street and parking either in the City Church parking lot or um, uh, at KTAC, walking over, attending services, then getting back in your car, going back across the street to pick up your children um, at the Covenant Gym. And so what this will do, again, as Chris noted, it will bring and keep everybody sort of on the same uh, campus um, for the church. And so taking this, this is the existing conditions um, as it is right now. Um, this is then, and this is a little, this is a little light 
um, it's a little faded back, but this is the existing conditions from a, from a survey perspective. You can see uh, uh, the parking area, you can see the existing, the existing church. Um, and then what we are proposing is to put this additional building on the back. Um, and then we would, you know, uh, there would be a site plan process that we would go through. And what we're showing here is preliminary grading and some thoughts with regards to preliminary stormwater. One of the things that I think is also important for us to note is um, when we look at that previous special use permit, um, one of the things that we have found, particularly during COVID, to be incredibly valuable with this site is the green space um, that is to the, to the top of this page, that triangular green space, which has been used for outdoor services or has been used for kids' activities or events after, um, after services and things of that nature. And it's really uh, proven to be an invaluable gathering space. And as part of this sort of reimagination of, of what the church's addition would look like and, and need to be, um, it, it was really thought, thought of in doing it in a way to preserve that space such that those activities can continue to um, occur there. Um, so uh, that kind of closes our presentation um, and we're certainly happy to answer any questions that anyone may have um, with regards to the application. Temps. I apologize a little bit. Uh, I was trying to get one member on. I was dealing <laughs> with IT issues. Okay, so who does anybody on the panel have any questions with respect to this? You can raise your hand so I, I can see you all. Uh, Rick, you're mute right now. Yeah, I've got two things that come to mind. One is just as as a uh, neighborhood facility, I'm just curious whether or not this new space, the new gymnasium space, will be available for uh, <clears throat> non-church related meetings. But is it a space that could be rented by other organizations and other groups uh, at times when the church is not using it? I'll answer that. We currently utilize our current facility for a lot of uh, other nonprofit groups. Um, for many of them, we do not charge. Uh, with this facility, it could be something where a nonprofit group might come in and we might need to charge just based on the you know, newness of it and kind of facilitating it and making sure it gets uh, scheduled properly. But it is something where you know community could use it. But I don't see that that would be a primary use of it. It would be more of a secondary because we schedule our facility very heavily throughout the week. So it's not open typically, um, but we would have access if possible. Okay, that's great. I mean, just it's another meeting space is always at a premium and and it's nice to know that you know there's a possibility you know, of, of it being available uh second question is more of an engineering question and that is that looking at the uh, rio road corridor study there were some suggestions made uh, by the consultant as, as part of the creation of the, the roundabout at Ryle Road and John Warner Parkway, that there might be some realignment suggested between the, uh, the city church entrance off of Ryle Road and connections through to KTEC and working on those, uh, on those entrances and, and exits. And I was just hoping that they were making the point that I think as you're looking at all of this, you know, to keep all of that in mind and factor in what's been proposed, uh, even though none of it has actually, I guess, been totally uh, accepted, but there is some proposed changes in that whole traffic flow between uh, City Church and KTEC and Railroad. Yeah, and we are we are um, we're very familiar with that. So I will. I know Chris has been in touch with the county um, a lot of times. I'm very familiar with the improvements that are are being discussed in the roundabout. Um, we're actually the engineer for the Rio Point project, and last time I think I was before you, I was part of that team. So 
Um, we've been, you know, very familiar with what's going on, you know, through this corridor and what those changes will be. I think that's sort of, um, you know, we're, we're probably being a little bit more reactionary to that as that roundabout comes online and, and potential other improvements um, come. But we have been in discussions with Albemarle County and transportation planner and um, certainly are aware of, of those, those items that have been discussed. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you, that's a good question. Any of the other, Pat, any other CAC members have a question? Okay, so I see that um, some of the attendees have I've raised hand on, so I have two on, on attendees. Let me start, just work my way down. Sharon Dudley, can we unmute her and she can ask a question? make a comment. Yes, uh, Sharon, you can unmute and speak. I am directly, I am on Greenbrier Terrace. And so we are right across the railroad tracks from you. And my biggest concern is traffic, which is a, a problem for those of us along the railroad corridor getting in and out. And uh, I just want to make sure that that is emphasized um, that if there's going to be a lot of extra cars at one time, that um, that is uh, noticed and addressed. Um, do you have any comments about that as far as traffic studies? Sure. Um, so we're so this application is not proposing any additional seats within the sanctuary. So. Um, one of the things that uh, was originally, I believe, Rebecca, you might have to help me on this, but was um, conditioned out from a special use permit perspective previously and would continue to be uh, was any sort of daycare or a thing, anything along those lines that would potentially bring uh, traffic to the site during your heavier peak times, your, you know, Monday and Tuesday at five o'clock or your uh, Wednesday and Thursday at eight o'clock in the morning where people are you know, mostly on the road. Um, what we actually believe is that some of the some of the traffic that's being generated by uh, youth programs uh, being scheduled across at Covenant Church will actually reduce some of the traffic that's going across uh, Rio and John Warner from from one side to the other. Um, as far as the additional parking is concerned, right now um, City Church has, has an agreement, and they have always uh, worked with KTEC. Um, with regards to uh, uh, sharing spaces over there. But one of the things that's also been thought of with this is wanting to ensure that if any if that agreement, which which is not, uh, you know, it's not a 30 year agreement or anything along those lines, but if it were to go away, that there would be sufficient parking here on this site. So we don't necessarily see that there's a lot of additional traffic that would be associated with this project, but rather we just we think there will be a reduction in people going across John Warner Parkway. Um, on Sunday mornings. Okay, thank you. I, I would just like to maybe follow up a little bit, Craig, but because I'm also sensitive to the traffic. Uh, there's a lot of traffic during the daytime. If you have events there, you're going to be spilling cars in in groups out on on uh, onto Rio. Uh, how is that going to be handled? And have you done any sort of traffic? impact studies that address the midday as well as you know the morning and evening so there certainly could be you know a, a, an event here or there at the church i don't think that there are plans at this point that there's any sort of high usage that's done during you know the middle of the week or anything along those lines and certainly again not during those peak times either early in the morning certain you know of course there are staff um, you know, um, you know, Chris is there as an example, right? That's that's where they, you know, they talked about office spaces and, and things like that. But that's a much smaller population, a much much smaller population than what you have on a Sunday morning, where you have those peak traffic uh, time or that peak traffic is down. Um, so from you know the 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 any kind of like the normal or weekday traffic um, would be very limited, um, and so we haven't really seen that as any sort of problem or concern with regards to what this addition's impact might be um, on John Warner and the surrounding roadways. Okay, fine, thank you. I saw Chris shaking his head, yes. 
<laughs> Correct. I mean, our main uh, primary usage is on Sunday mornings, right. and then our other big times are evenings or weekends. So it's not during the peak hours during the day. Um, you know, there's sometimes smaller groups there, but nothing that would, you know, be like a Sunday morning impact at all. So I don't envision that at all. Okay, fine. Thank you very much. Okay, we had one other uh, hand. Oh, I have two other hands. Uh, Laddie Carr. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Laddie? Hi. Yes, hi. My name is Laddie Carr, and uh, I live on 2240 Benbury Street, which is exactly at the edge of the property. Uh, what we are looking now, it will be the lower left side. Um, I know I, I have been living there now for a while, and I know the church had some work done with the parking lot a few years back don't remember exactly the year, maybe uh, some of you do. And after that, um, there is a, every time it rains, there is a huge flood of water coming from that non-permeable parking lot into the creek that washes out our trees. We had so many trees falling down. The neighbors are losing their property because the fences are now falling into the creek. Now I see actually increased by putting the additional building. I see the increase on the steepness of the hill, which means more water coming our way. Um, I'm wondering how that will be addressed because um, when we just last summer put a, a fence onto our property, we had to move it three feet into our property because we already lost three feet off uh, into the creek. So. Um, how that it's going to be addressed. Sure, so I, I can't speak to the total uh, drainage area that might see its way to the creek, but what I can tell you with regards to um, this property and how that would be addressed is um, we would have to adhere to um, some pretty stringent uh, state guidelines with regards to stormwater quantity and the way in which that stormwater would run off of the site. Um, you're exactly right. Uh, you know, when you add impervious area, there is the potential that you have more runoff. And so what the state regulations uh, require us to do is to ensure that uh, a one year storm event, so your most frequent type storm events, um, they get choked back such that the flow that would um, leave the site usually is somewhere about around 15 to 20 percent um of what it is today from a flow perspective um the volume is still there um but it's just that flow is kind of um, held back in either sort of a pond or an underground type of detention system for this site we're thinking it's a it's a pond and you can see that there's sort of this circular area on the left to the left of the proposed building on the image in front of you um, and that gets sized and goes through a you know a fairly rigorous set of calculations on our end, as well as a review um, with the county. And then for uh, larger rain events, um, we also are looking at the 10 year and the 100 year storm. Um, the 10 year storm, we're, we're choking back to make sure that there's no more uh, water that's flowing off of a site than is um, before it's, it's developed. And then the 100 year, we're also ensuring and, and looking at that as well. Um, so one of the things that I, I would say is that we can, uh, is, is that we would certainly take a look at what is happening from a downstream perspective as well, because I think we also recognize the importance of wanting to be a good neighbor and, um, and, and taking a look at it from that perspective. Aaron, is that okay? So I, I don't know, can you still hear me? Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. yeah. I, I hear you, and I, and I don't want to be the pain in the neck, but uh, as, as probably Amtrak can tell you, they removed quite a few trees from there because of the wash of the water that increased after there was some additional construction down there, and um, I, you know, I having a pond and that may hold some water. I just wonder what if it doesn't work? And every time, honestly, if there is a, a, a slightly heavier rain, 
the amount of water that it comes through the pipe that it goes under the tracks right into the backyard part of the creek it's enormous enormous and that changed after there was a change in whatever the parking lot was um, done there so um, I remember trying to talk to the city because it's part of the city and city was like well we can't do anything it's coming from county and I just worry that I will get stuck in this between you know my property is in the city but the church is in the county so um, you know and then when the when the building is built and the water increases even more and we keep losing you know our backyard and the fences are falling in what's the next step okay uh, uh may I Rebecca? Add yeah, yeah I put my hand up just so that's that's the purpose of this meeting like even if you're in the city we invited you for that reason um and we have a county engineer and deputy county engineer that are part of the review team so, you know, Craig said he was going to, you know, we we're going to follow up on that. Um, this isn't a meeting where we're going to have all the solutions identified in the meeting, but it's something just because you're in the city doesn't mean we can't go over there and look at it and we'll, we'll follow up on this. Um, and it, we definitely hear your concern and have documented it as part of our review. Um, but, and then as Craig said, you know, not only do the engineers review it at this stage, um, but there is the, always the, um, the site plan and the water protection ordinance and erosion and sediment control measures that need to be complied with and the purpose of those reviews are to address um, you know, the, the issues that you're bringing up and um, that would be part of the site plan process, um, which you would also receive a notice about when it gets to that point, if the special uses permit is approved, um, since this would be you know, a level of change to the site where we would do notifications again, um, so I just thought I'd, I'd let you know about that as far as what's part of the process. And, um, you know, we did, you know, we did invite everyone that was um, an abutting owner in the city to this meeting as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, I see there's one more hand for attendees and then one from the uh, 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 CAC member. JD, is that right? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I live next to Lottie. And um, I guess first my, you know, regarding what Rebecca said, if there is monitoring of sediment and other environmental conditions, why hasn't that already been done when the person next to Lottie, their yard is already falling into the creek and they lost their fence. So that's one thing that I'm concerned about is if, you know, those things are already supposed to be looked after, why haven't they been so far when there's stuff happening. The other uh, well, thing I wanna, let me finish, okay? okay. Don't interrupt me because- uh, I wasn't um, trying to interrupt you. There was a pause. Okay. Just let so, me know when you're finished. Um, Mr. Katarski talks about doing one and 100 year storm event assessments, but in the US we've had 5,000 year storm events or rain events um, this year. In 2016, it was three. So with climate change, these things are increasing all the time. So we, you know, I don't know if you've paid attention to our rains this year, but it has been torrential. And um, I expect that this kind of thing will continue. And so I think that um, if there's going to be environmental assessments of this thing, they need to account for a thousand year rain events, um, not just dinky Charlottesville storms that have been, that have taken place in the past. I also want to point out the height of the trees. Um, at my house, the trees are at least 100 feet tall, okay? And if those erode and fall over, my house is in, you know, in the path of those trees. They're enormous. And, um, you know, you can see if you go down in the creek, you can see where trees have fallen in in the last few years. And I've done stream restorations and I see that this is a lot deeper than it should be. And I went over to the church and I looked at the path of water flow coming down in that big hollow right behind the building. And it just looks like a big disaster to me. I'm sorry to sound angry, but it's something that I really care about. And I really hate to see this, you know, the park is right down the street. It's a very special part of Charlottesville. And I really hate to think of anything endangering that um, valuable community resource. Rebecca. 
was that all was that all you wanted to share yes thank you okay thank you yeah and that's um yeah thank you for bringing all of this to our attention you know uh, we don't have jurisdiction over the city and i'm not sure there's different rules for um sites to develop with commercial uses and require site plans and y'all are a residential neighborhood but um, we will certainly follow up on this um like we mentioned and if y'all um did Lottie, did you say, you said Banbury Street, but I don't know what y'all's addresses are. If you want to send me an email with your address and so we can, um, or if you uh, jot down my email. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I have your email and I will send okay. you, send you yeah. my uh, location We have county well. staff that live on Banbury Street too, I think. Um, or Fantastic. <laughs> if they're against the creek as we are, then they're losing their yeah. property too. No, and, oh, I had a question for you. You mentioned when the parking lot changed, because I was going back. I don't know if Chris or Craig, um, because the, the last site plan was from 2005, so I'm not sure what changed on the site that you said you seemed to notice an increase in water flow. Was that? There was a, like a pipe or something put there because now it's it's like the water that comes from the parking lot, it comes, you know, it yeah. comes honestly maybe five meters above my property line. And yeah. so it starts washing out. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we'll and just we'll follow up. So, so just just on my on my edge of my property, we lost four trees in the past few years. Um, massive trees. Some of them had to be removed by Amtrak because they fell, you know, across the the line there. Um, so that that's all. And and as as JD spoke. You know, I know you don't have jurisdiction over city, but as you just said, Rebecca, you don't have it. And that's where we worry that because it's this in the middle, you know, um, it, it, it will it will kind of be nobody's business. <laughs> well, the state, the regulations are statewide and the regulations are in place to protect properties, whether they're in the city or the county, like the, the neighboring properties. It's just when you said, well, we, when, you, when we were talking about monitoring and what is happening in your neighbor's yard in the city with fencing and things eroding, that's not something that um, that you you would bring that up with your city folks. You know, if, if this special use permit wasn't in, obviously, um, you know, we, we the city and the county can still talk to each other. And um, but ultimately, you know, the city engineer Mm -hmm. and staff is responsible for the city side of the line and we're the county side of the line um I, I, is there somebody that they should contact in the city rebecca that comes to mind not for me but i know frank or emily would know our our engineering staff and possibly well craig probably knows because you do work in the city too craig i'm sure you can um, i would recommend reaching out to neighborhood development services development services Thank you. And, I, and I'll just throw out one other quick thing in regards to that. The city does have, I'm not super familiar with it, but they do have like um, a fund for um, like properties with drainage issues. Um, so it is something to potentially reach out to them and, and, and ask them about. I'm sure that they would schedule and come by at some point. Um, am I still live? Yes, you are. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, so th that's that comes back to what I said. I did I did brought the neighborhood services. I did talk to the water management group in the city. They walked around, they explored it, they said, Oh, all that it's coming from the church property, and they have no jurisdiction over it. And that's where it ended. And that's why you know, yes, I did have them over the last time the tree fell and I was like, we lost another tree. So I did contacted them. And when they went over, they said they cannot do anything because it's not coming. The water is not running from my property. It's running from the church property. And that's what washes out the, the backyards. Okay, I think uh, we've got the picture. Maybe Rebecca can follow up somehow. Uh, but you'll note it for sure and see where we're at. Uh, I have two of uh, the CAC members have questions.
questions. Can I ask you to make them fairly quick? Nancy, you had your hand up for a long time. You can mute. I'm mute. I think I've unmuted. Hi, Marty. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have great sympathy with these water issues. And I am fully aware that while there is an attempt by staff, at least in the county, uh, to try and monitor things, they don't have the staff to do this. So, Craig, hi, I'm glad you're working on another project. However, uh, a retention pond, which will, of course, bring geese, and you will learn to love them and the mess that they make or an underwater retention slow release system, which is more expensive, are the two things that you su suggested might be on the table. However, one, the laws and the regulations regulating stormwater are so far behind the times, it's ridiculous. Two, there are a number of impervious surfaces that one can put in parking lots, it is also possible to find a way to retain the water so that you all can use it at the church for irrigation or other non-human um, related, like washing dishes or whatever. And I would really ask you to consider that because whatever the regulations are, they are not sufficient. We had four inches of rain the other day. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let me see who else. Audrey, you have something? Yes, I support what Nancy has said and would like to see increased responsibility by the church and the planning that is going on to take care of this in a more community way. I also, um, and I would think that passing this special permit should require some stronger mitigation of potential water problems. I also wonder if our um, supervisor, Ned Galloway, could contact the city and be more of an advocate for um, protecting our community from water damage, such as what's going on now. This just didn't happen. I understand from listening to the conversation, it sounds like this began or got worse after um, additions and changes and building of the church in the first place. Thank okay. you. And we Thanks. have, um, you know, we have a complaint line and, <laughs> and, you know, um, I'm not telling you to call and complain about the church, but we do have a complaint line that if you live in the city and you have a concern about a county property, that includes building code, it includes storm water, it includes engineering issues and, um, uh, zoning issues so maybe you know when we reach out to the city we let them know i don't know if it sounds like they didn't encourage you to contact the county um or you you could always contact us if you have questions um as well you don't have to call the complaint line but um you can contact their <laughs> engineering department um okay fine thank you i think pretty much cover the ground that we need to, Rebecca. Do you have any final thoughts that you want to close out with other than what you just said? <laughs> no, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for, for attending the meeting so we can, um, you know, that's what this is for, to get those questions and concerns on the table as the project goes through the review process. And we'll follow up um, with Craig and the church and our engineering staff um, and, um, that when this when this goes forward, um, if it you know as it goes forward to the planning commission and the board, we document what concerns came up at the meeting. We include a link to the meeting, and um, you know part of the report. You know when we talk about neighbors, this will be discussed and um, and brought up as far as um, you know what we found out and and uh, if there is anything in additional anything above and beyond the ordinance um, or, ordinances that we believe is necessary and is a, you know, a documented impact, um, then you know, special use permits can get approved with conditions that require things that are um, in addition to the minimum ordinance standards. I'm not saying that's where we're going, but I'm just saying you know, special use permits 
include um, for this site, you know, accord with the, you know, they would build according to whatever plan gets approved. And, you know, they're uh, the 500, um, you know, usually we, we have the number of attendees for the area of assembly and things like that. So anything else you have questions about or want to follow along in the process, just contact me and we can keep you informed. And um, so that's, that's it. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. I see, uh, Chris, did you want to say something? Your hand is up. Yeah, I did just want to mention, uh, this was the first time that I've ever heard that there's been water drainage and causing problems to our neighbors. And so from the church's standpoint, we want to be good neighbors. And so I just wanted to apologize that that has happened and also say like, hey, I definitely want to look into it and make sure that we are being good neighbors as we try to be for every side uh, of our neighbors. So uh, I definitely want to make sure that this is definitely looked into and um, I'm going to be in the stream here pretty soon taking a look myself. So um, I just wanted to say sorry to those who have attended and thank you for the commission to listen in as well. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so I'm going to close this part of the meeting. Um, Craig, uh, give me back my screen. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the next topic is an overview of uh, future public safety operations facility at Fashion Square Mall. Um, Hello, Lance Stewart. Yeah, here it's Lance Stewart. I was, uh, excuse me, Lance, I'm going to turn this over to you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Marty. Thank you for inviting me. Um, again, uh, everybody, I'm Lance Stewart. I'm with Albemarle County. I work with Craig fairly frequently on some projects and, uh, of course, um, Rebecca and, and David as well. It's nice to meet, meet you all. Um, so uh, Marty reached out uh, to see if I could um, provide a bit of an update on um, a project that was recently approved by the Board of Supervisors at the um, it's a new lease recently ex executed of uh, a portion of the JVC Penny site. And of course, since I'm a, a government employee, I have a PowerPoint. So um, I will uh, in just one second share my screen so that um, you can see my wonderful PowerPoint. Okay, is that full sized? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So I'm um, just going to walk you through a little bit of what's driving um, the, um, the, the lease that we've, we've entered into at the JC Penney's in terms of the fire rescue department and the police department's uh, growing space needs over time, a, a little bit about the functions that we're going to put there, um, and uh, the details of uh, the inside of the site. And then I'll, I'll try to be kind of quick about this so that mostly I can... Um, answer your question. So um, when I presented this to the Board of Supervisors a, a few months ago, I was lucky enough to have the, the uh, head of our, our rescue department and our police chief covering um, these uh, slides. And so I, I can tell you that they're, they're better at doing that than I am. But um, for fire rescue, I, I think many of you are aware that over time, uh, the department has grown. Um, the volunteer fire stations and rescue stations uh, have really, you know, struggled to to stay fully staffed uh, with volunteers over time, and they've also taken on some uh, responsibility for maintenance of all of the the vehicles of the volunteer stations. As our own, um, you know, fire rescue stations have have grown, have consolidated for all of the the fire rescue op operations, um, purchasing and warehousing of equipment. Um, so they, they've, they've added like fleet maintenance responsibilities, a lot of logistics storage, the, the uniforms that uh, fire, fire personnel in particular um, have are centralized and stored and have to be specially um, stored for those purposes. Uh, and they're really struggling to, to meet those demands as they have to you know, drive to each each station to try to do some basic maintenance or repairs to vehicles and not necessarily having the equipment or they find the issue but don't find that they don't have the part and so they've got to drive to another location to get the part and drive back they have to do that often um, out outdoors um, which is difficult to do in particular in the winter or in the rain to, to safely maintain vehicles so they have a lot of storage needs um, and uh, you know those, to the extent that they have been able to have been accommodated 
at the various stations, but also to the extent that they can at our Fifth Street office building where their offices are, which they have dramatically um, outgrown over time. So they, they've hired, um, uh, as they've taken on all these operational functional needs, they've also, uh, you know, hired new management staff to assume, you know, to help to assume the responsibilities that they've taken on, including um, staffing additional volunteer stations. So, you know, it's been a, a, a real difficult challenge for them. And for, for, the, for several years now, we've been looking for uh, opportunities for spaces um, to, to purchase or rent um, or, uh, or just construct on, on county land to, to find some kind of solution. Um, while at the same time, uh, the police department has grown uh, as the county has, has grown. Um, so, you know, they have had identified issues for, for quite a while uh, for evidence storage. Um, if you've been down to the Fifth Street office building um, in the last few years, you'll, you'll know that about a third of the total parking space available for that building is taken up with, with special equipment of both uh, police department and fire rescue for emergency responses. The, 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 the entire basically the entirety of the um the section closest to fifth street is taken up by these you know large pieces of equipment um but they also have secure storage needs um seized property needs they they have a site where they um secure siege seized vehicles for instance right now um that that's not secure um it doesn't protect those vehicles from the elements um and they have some, you know, growing needs. They recently, um, for the the budget year we're in now, are partnering with Fire Rescue and um, with social services to create a new mental health unit that sort of bridges those three groups. Um, so as they're adding officers and um, and sergeants and functions, uh, the Fifth Street building is is um, been inadequate to meet those needs and increasingly inadequate. So. Um, we picked J.C. Penney's, and uh, and again, I'll, I'll mention this was, um, you know, a, several years long searches looking at every industrial or commercial property um, that was on the market for purchase or lease. Um, but but Penney's, you know, turned out to be really the perfect location um, from from our viewpoint. It's centrally located for the for the um, in terms of the you know the remote uh, distances that all of the for instance, fire and rescue station personnel must come to get the, get their equipment or uh, or to bring in equipment to be uh, maintained. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a few minutes um, about the specific part of J.C. Penney's that that uh, we are about to execute a lease for. Um, and uh, so, I don't know if you if you've been around a while, you may remember that Penney's used to have a tire shop on the southern side of that. That they they um, and close that, but we'll, we would be reopening it again, uh, which has a lot of storage in there. And then there's quite a, a, a bit of office space, existing office space in there that, that can help house some some functions to take a little bit of uh, stress off both the police and fire in terms of their office space needs. And I mentioned the you know the, the equipment that's uh, clogging up the Fifth Street parking lot. Um, it's a very large site that's owned um, by the owners of the current owners of the JC Penny um, that we can use to move some of that storage off site and, and begin to return to normal for um, conference use, uh, early voting periods, uh, and as we go post pandemic in terms of um, you know normal occupancy uh, of the building by staff. Uh, and, and a big benefit is um, that we found is that the owner is local. Um, they're invested in this community in a, in a lot of ways. Um, it, it's, you know, the rest of Fashion Square Mall right, currently is owned by a bank and receivership. Um, a, a lot of the properties that are that, that we looked at um, weren't suitable uh, from a number of perspectives, but, you know, also not having someone that you can actually talk to um, and, and, you know, know, that, know their reputation and know how you know, that they're committed to this community and to their investment in the property, that they're just not flipping things. Um, but, you know, the, the last bullet here is, is available. Uh, obviously, most of Fashion Square Mall is uh, currently available, but the J.C. Penney's is on a, on a different parcel and has been, uh, other than our use of it as a, a mass vaccination clinic that we leased for the health department, 
has been unoccupied for, for several years. Um, so uh, this is a floor plan of J.C. Penney's. I'm sure it, it it might not be quite as hard to read as Craig's drawing was a few minutes ago of the site plan. But um, to the left side of the screen is um, is U.S. Um, 29. Um, so it's it's north at the top and south at the bottom. Um, this is the. If, can you see my cursor when I move it around? Okay, great. So this was the open retail space that we're all familiar with. Uh, what we what we don't get to see um, as, as former shop shoppers is the back of the house. So there's a large loading dock here, um, an enormous warehouse space. Uh, this is uh, this portion of it here is um, was the office space, uh, public restrooms here, some additional sp storage space, and this was the former tire shop. Uh, so um, the photo at the bottom is the warehouse. This shows about half of it. Um, it's really very large. The doors you see at the end there are the, the large double doors to the loading dock. So apparently they had a, um, you know, a, a lot of mattresses um, and um, clothes stored back back there. And you know, it's just an amazingly workable space if you're going to build things out within, just to be able to work, you know, with with these columns uh, without having to, you know, demolish a lot of things for. Um, existing use or construct um, new things. And then on the right side of the screen, behind that tire shop area, there's a there's a, a two level area of just fantastic storage um, space for for smaller uh, equipment. So um, and then I mentioned the site. So this is the the yellow lines here are the parcel boundary. So you can see they actually own a portion of the entrance. All of this uh, area on the south side of the parcel that has been used um, as a vaccination site. There's a, a more than 160 spaces there that um, are really not parked in at all. And so we imagine uh, fencing off some of this um, section, if not all of it, to take all of those um, vehicles down at Fifth Street, plus I'm sure some you know staging ground for uh, fire rescue equipment that would be maintained within the building um, could could be here as well. So, you know, it's making good use of, a, of an underutilized space. Um, so we've got. Um, I'm just covering real quickly what's going in there and what our what our budget is. Um, so, I'm just going to pause for a second because your faces are in front of my bullets. There we go. Um, so you know we'll be modernizing that office space. It is um, it's laid out pretty well, but it is. Um, you know, the, the carpet's, uh, you know, 40 years old, it needs paint, it needs ceiling tiles, it needs lighting, and of course we'll have to put in security measures um, within, within that um, so that the functions that are, that are housed in there are, are, are secure. So we've got uh, anticipating within that room, uh, the relocating the police department's uh, traffic unit, possibly some other functions as well. Um, the fire rescue quartermaster is the person that manages the, um, uh, all of their their supplies, which are ample, uh, would have office space. Um, that that large warehouse would be uh, partially, uh, you know, uh, equipment storage, parts storage, um, the uniform storage, some some light office space. Um, if you're wondering where the 3.1 million dollars would go, a, a good bit of that is going to end up going to, um, you know, removing a large section of that concrete floor and re-pouring it um, thicker with with uh, reinforced concrete so that that can bear the load of actual fire trucks that'll be going, you know, be pulled in there uh, to be maintained. So that's just one example of, um, of where the, you know, the budget is going. And in that, uh, that tire shop area, um, we are looking at, you know, secure storage uh, for uh, primarily police department functions, uh, evidence storage, um, seized vehicle uh, processing, some of that done inside and out of the elements in a secure environment. Um, I can tell you that we've, uh, my, my team and uh, facilities environmental services who are managing the project have made um, even better friends with, with leadership of both police and fire because they are just tickled um, 
to finally get some relief out here and can't wait um, to start moving in. So um, at Fifth Street, uh, you know, this does, uh, once we've managed to move these functions out, um, it gives us an opportunity to create additional training space um, for, for fire rescue and police um, folks, uh, much needed office space as well. I mentioned that mental health unit, um, you know, what if the traffic unit and perhaps another unit or two, if we can make it work, move out, that helps be able to accommodate the mental health unit and also future growth um, and, a, and a great deal of recovered um, parking for staff and visitors. Um, and, you know, that I have a few more slides about lease terms and all that um, uh, as backup slides, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen because that's the, from my viewpoint, the, the, the stuff that you'd, you'd need to see. But uh, I'll tell you that at this point, we've got, um, we'll be executing within the week um, that lease that I mentioned. We're going to be um, starting off with a, with a 10 year term. And we'll have options within that for up to two additional five-year terms. Um, so uh, that'll be executed soon. We are already um, doing design on the project and actually intend to kind of do it in packages to move things in as quickly as we can, um, while some of the, the bigger, more difficult work to, to design and bid and construct um, works its, its way through the pipeline so we can begin to relieve um, some of the issues we have without waiting uh, for a full-blown all-at-once project. So uh, that's that's the bottom line there for you. For you. Um, Marty, I hope that was sufficient. It's a good for start. Yeah, and, thank you. Yeah. I'm just going to raise some questions. I already see the first one up. Todd, go ahead. You start and unmute. Okay. Okay. Um... You're muted, Todd, again. Todd, you're muted. You're still muting. I don't know what the issue is. The show's muted, so. Okay. How's that? Good, go ahead. You got it? Yes. I was wondering how it's going to how that's going to work with the future use of the rest of the mall, or if we even know what that's going to be. You know, um, I mean, I've heard like that they're going to tear it down, you know, and build apartments or something. Um, you know, that, that's that's a great question. Um, certainly, one that that um, that that we looked at closely as staff before we ever um, even considered bringing it to the board. Um, you know, I, I believe, you know, this owner is the one, um, um, this, the company, but the main owner's name is Richard Hewitt that owns the Comdal building, the, the former Comdal building, which, which you know has a lot of, you know, uses in it now. There's a brewery, there's the high school center, um, there's, you know, offices, startup stuff. So, you know, he really sees the vision for this separate parcel, which is which is, you know, which is other than a common exterior wall, it is a completely separately owned parcel with its own um, electricity and gas and water supply and sprinkler system as being a, you know, an investment in, you know, in the local communities, you know, businesses, not as a development opportunity. So, you know, the, the rest of the site, um, it, you know, can be uh, redeveloped without, without um, this JC Penney site impacting that. Now they'll, they'll have to work together and, you know, in terms of traffic flow and, you know, it, it may get complicated, but, you know, there's, it's not anticipated uh, that in the near term that the entirety of the mall excluding pennies would be redeveloped. And if, and if it is, we'll have to cross that bridge. And I'd say, you know, if there is a, you know, a very, very compelling reason if we had, you know, a, you know, five years notice. And I think we probably would, you know, given the pace of development, um, you know, and, you know, design and building and construction um, that, that, you know, we might choose to relocate and start instead of being required to relocate in order to, um, you know, facilitate something that's, you know, very beneficial for, um, for the, you know, the Rio 29 small area plan and the, and the vision there. I don't think we would we would stand in the way with that, but we would have to have 
you know, an appropriate opportunity elsewhere to, to, to rent or construct. And I hope that was helpful. I'm not, um, you know, I'm a buildings, public works type of guy. I'm not an economic development guy, but I golf with one. So I, I hope that does help. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Audrey? Yeah. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Let, wait, wait one second. Todd, are you okay now? Yeah. Okay. okay thank I'm fine. You. Audrey? So I gather that my question is also about around traffic flow and things like that and integration with other uses of that building like Leggett's and the current stores that are there. So I gather that a plan has not been made from, from your discussion. I gather that a plan has not been made about traffic flow. Um, that's right. We're, you know, there is, because it's an interior renovation, you know, there's no requirement um, for, for us to um, address traffic flow. Um, this is not a, a, a facility that the public will access. Um, well, where is the public traffic going to go? Is, is, will this be gated with high wire fences? That all, how are people going to circulate, who are visiting the shops there, going to circulate around uh, the property, I mean, before you would go by that back part and out onto Hillsdale. Sure. I'm going to share my screen again and just um, show the site. One second. <coughs> so, um, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay. So the um, you can see there's a, there's an apartment complex here to the south, um, and uh, to the left of this red area, there is um, a permanent easement um, we we to al allow flow between these two sites. So we would not be putting any fence up, other than around some portion or all of, you know, this remote parking area. So the the circulation pattern. This is the entrance um, to the left here from. Rio 29, this would not be interrupted in any way. Um, no, no flow this way would be interrupted. And, and our, our lease area, if you can see my cursor here, is roughly right along this line. So the, the remaining two thirds approximately of the, the penny site would be unoccupied until um, the landlord leases it. So, um, you know, and each of those would, would be you know, um, you know, commercial or, or, you know, uh, well, I assume commercial enterprises of one kind or another, uh, and anything that he does that would be done that would impact traffic flow that would, you know, that would where that would be um, uh, a, a permanent installation would be subject to review by our um, community development departments, um, folks who you know, so well, does that answer your question? So in other words, no. So in other words, I could drive uh, past the old main entrance to J.C. Penney and come up along around that curve and go around the back, or around the front. Okay. Absolutely. My other question and my concern is if there are stores and office uh, facilities, how much fuel is going to be stored here? If we're in the middle of a neighborhood and a major highway, we'll have is no fuel storage. Of... No, we'll have oh, no fuel storage. I thought one of your outlines said fuel. Um, no, ma'am. Oh, well, that's good. Thank you. Okay. I'm finished. Okay. Could you uh, go back uh, and share your screen again, Lance, please? Absolutely. Okay. So I thought somebody was going to ask. Uh, there's, some, there's some concern. I thought Audrey actually, I'm going to put words in my mouth, has always expressed concern in the evening where the buses are centered. And so the question I have is how much police visible activity will be around that area, the whole area? I don't, I don't think you can ex expect any um, okay. additional police activity in, in that area. I, I'm familiar with, with uh, that entrance near the, the food court. Um, I, I would imagine that there, there will be some, uh, that the majority of the traffic um, that comes in to access what are really back of the house, you know, functions um, would be coming off of Hillsdale Drive or 29. Um, so this this really isn't intended as a, um, you know, as an 
as a police station. It, it, okay. it really is a back of the house uh, police and fire rescue operations. Center. Okay. So I know I'm asking that a little bit because one of the other members who's not here tonight had that as an impression that it would be more activity. That's why I want to just cl clarify that. Okay, so thank you. Any other questions? So thank you very much. That was very interesting. Good luck on that. Uh, um, oh, well, thank you. Yeah. We're, we're pretty excited and I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it. Okay, great. Have a good okay. evening. You too. Uh, the next item on our, e on our agenda are the liaison updates. Ned, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Sorry for joining late. All right, I got a little bit of a list and I'll go through. Some of this will need to be some follow-up um, that I'll have to chase down. Um, Marty, you had sent a couple of questions in. We, um, I was able to get those into David's hands to send out. David, do we have any updates on that tonight or do we, because I know the who you were reaching out to was not in the office today. Yeah, I apologize for sending it late. We, I just... Well, I mean, my understanding is that your points for the Rio Commons and the uh, widening and all of that are supposed yeah. to uh, get addressed uh, as it goes, that yes, that should be on their radar, but I wanted to confirm that with the transportation planners. So yeah, the, that'll the probably have to I be sent, just to follow up. The things I sent you, Ned, uh, Kevin was able to confirm. So oh, and, okay. I can, I and, I, and I can go over that too. I didn't if you could, I because I, I didn't see that email. I just saw the one that uh, said, uh, somebody was out of the office for today. Yeah, um, yeah, do you want, I can, you want me to go over the questions, Marty, and then- Yeah, yeah would that okay. be helpful to that, yes. <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, let me grab them, because I put them somewhere so I can actually read them. Uh, Marty had posed uh, some questions to, to Ned and I, uh, that was, um, has the Raya Road traffic study been forwarded to VDOT? Um, and that this is a particular issue given the Rio Commons and Rio Point developments. Um, and That's so cool. what we have, uh, we have, VDOT is aware of the study and the staff's input to VDOT and the applicants has been based on the draft work that had been done to date up to the board's uh, acceptance of the plan in, on August 3rd. So that document has been used in dialogue with uh, both Rio Point and Rio Commons. Um, and the improvements that are being uh, developed by Rio Point are consistent with the dialogue between the consultant and the plan. Um, and all the improvements shown fit within the right of way that's being dedicated and the shared use path is being constructed. Um, so that for work Rio Point, um, the median, the raised median, however, is in the right of way. Um, and that is that part of the project would have to be a future public project. That's something that we would need to uh, get prioritized by the Board of Supervisors along with the other projects and ultimately get funded. But the available right of way um, after construction uh, for Rio Point is adequate to accommodate that. My and question was focused. I knew I knew that. Yeah, and but I'm I getting to Rio Ryo, Commons. Yeah, yeah. Right. Rio Commons is a different project because it's a buy right project. You have to keep that in mind. So we have very little leverage to require such improvements with Rio Commons. Rio Commons has been resubmitted as an initial plan that's just now under review. Um, those comments and um, uh, and recommendations in that plan have been forwarded and made part of the uh, input to that um, review process. Um, but keep in mind as a buy right project, we don't have the leverage to require additional right of way or improvements beyond the minimum improvements required by VDOT or required by our ordinance. Uh, we had the applicant um, appears willing to do the shared use path. And there are still outstanding comments from VDOT uh, regarding the intersection improvements in the left and right turn lane. So that again is still part of their review process. They have not completed that. Um, but again, those improvements as best, uh, uh, we are going to be sitting down with them and trying to encourage them to provide for sufficient right of way along that frontage for those improvements to come in. But again, as a by right development, different than Rio Point, 
uh, we don't have the leverage of the rezoning process to require those improvements. Let, let me just, I, I don't know if everybody has really uh, absorbed all of the, uh, the corridor study, but the principal recommendation for the area, for the road in front of Royal Commons and Royal Point was to widen that. And so the county needed, uh, in order to handle the traffic flow, Ryo Point had done that. And now we're talking about Ryo Commons and what leverage we have. And I thought the leverage was through VDOT, I think. Well, it may be, and a point of clarification, it may be semantics, but it's important in terms of capacity improvements. The VDOT project, or excuse me, the, the Ryo Corridor Plan does not actually recommend a widening for capacity. The proposed improvement is still a two lane road with left and right turn lanes. So VDOT's recommendations will be along those lines for what types of improvements are needed along that two lane section and the length of right turn lanes and location of entrances and things such as that. The improvement is a cross-sectional improvement that takes that median and the dead areas between the left and right turn lanes and creates a raised median. So it's just from a planning and engineering perspective, uh, widening usually is associated with additional lanes for capacity. That's not recommended by the quarter study. Uh, it's a traffic management type of uh, recommendation within that study. And, VDOT, and VDOT's comments, and they are asking, I believe if I understand from Cameron, they are asking for additional analysis of the left and right turn movements that might dictate what type of improvements are needed. And okay. that's still a work in process. Okay. The David, second, I appreciate you chasing that down today. Yeah. Uh, the second question was regarding the swimming pool uh, at Rio uh, Point. And that has been moved closer to uh, Rio Road essentially. And the question was asked, uh, whether the county has any leverage or control or to regulate uh, operational hours. And it, it does not, uh, according to our zoning administrator, uh, private pools uh, are actually considered, uh, and the noise from a private pool uh, is considered, I think it's called private voices. It is not subject to uh, noise ordinance regulations. Um, so the county doesn't have any direct leverage on uh, establishing or providing for some control for noise. I think I would point out that probably um, most um, real uh, managers of properties are going to be cognizant of the impacts of noise to their own residents on site. So I suspect that there usually will be some type of noise limits just to protect those residents that are right next to the pool from, from noise impacts. But that's the, the quick answer to Thank that you. question. Yeah. Ned, I, I just think that this is something the county ought to look at. As we become more denser, as the county pushes to become more dense in terms of buildings, you would think that there are pools, in particular swimming pools, where in big developments, uh, you would like to have some control over the hours of operation. Not, I, you can't control the noise exactly, but at least the hours uh, would seem to be something that the county ought to look at for the future. Uh, I understood there were no regulations now. And that was just the point that I was trying to make with that second question. Understood. Okay. Uh, Audrey, so you know, you're ready for me to go through the rest yes, of my list? Yeah, yes. The, um, so the Rio Road Corridor study was heard before the board and then accepted by the board. And um, versus going through all the comments that I made that night at the meeting, I would uh, suggest that if you're interested in um, everything I had to say about the study that uh, uh, go to that meeting uh, and watch the video. And uh, we had some a C, I know we had some CAC members logged in listening, and we had uh, some folks even in attendance there in person. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that that study's in place. Um, a couple of the high points, though, that it is a planning document, that as individual projects come out, then the corridor study comes out to inform what the actual projects could or may be or should be. Um, and then I made sure that the roundabout current location that's been funded and approved by VDOT 
um, the placement of it uh, that my improve or my approval or vote for the corridor study in no way endorsed options uh, two and three for that roundabout. The current placement is where I want it. Um, and made that clear that that was the wishes of the board, uh, in my opinion. Um, Marty questions. I guess the other highlight, just knowing that it's been talked about where the, uh, there was seemed to be support by other supervisors for my idea that let's go ahead and make the Belvedere uh, improvements a lighted option to start. And then if it's not needed, it can be pulled down versus the reverse of what happens. Well, let's build the infrastructure to put lights up and then wait and see until it's warranted. I think it needs to be lighted from the get-go. My, my thinking is that it'll end up being something that the lights are on for certain segments of the day based on the volume and aren't necessarily needed uh, you know, during the lower volume points after certain times a day, et cetera, maybe on weekends and those types, sorts of things. But with the way that those lights can be programmed these days, I think it's wise to go ahead and put it in um, from the start. Um, and then the other comments can be viewed uh, watching the video of the meeting. I also got a question. I don't know if Michael uh, is on today. He, he, is, on. The car, he is on. Um, about the uh, Woodbrook uh, safe routes to school and the Carsbrook speeding study. I do not have an update I can provide on that tonight. So I've put that on my list to go chase that down. And then I'll, uh, Michael, if you're listening, I'll uh, happy to obviously update this body, but you probably don't want to wait a month for the update. So let me chase that down and I'll uh, email you out direct. Um, the, uh, I have still been dealing with speeding issues in addition to the Carsbrook area that he, that Michael's asking about. There's also one internal to Woodbrook, obviously from Belvedere, I'm still getting issues and there's other places that, that come up as well. Um, so I'm, I'm, I've put a lot of time or work in with staff on some questions in Belvedere. I'll be hoping to update the Belvedere HOA president uh, uh, directly with all the information that's been gleaned on that, they'll just, it, it'll, uh, relative to their uh, uh, speed device that they've purchased and other speed issues that are, that are going on throughout that community. Um, the micro transit grant that you've heard me speak of before, that is that uh, was approved. So uh, at the start of the year, that's still on point or on target, provided that CAT can pull this off staffing wise, um, but we're hoping that that micro transit pilot will actually be uh, up and functional at the start of the next year, which was the target from from the beginning. So that was great news that 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 was uh, that we that that grant was awarded. Um, you should see in the next I don't know the meeting date yet, but I'm anticipating it'll be in September. I had talked before about the boundary lines for the Rio 29 CAC and the hydraulic CAC being adjusted. It basically moves the, the actual map or geographic boundary to what we're doing in practice in terms of membership. Um, for our CAC, that means that the area where the, um, where, um, where VIA, the Virginia Institute of Autism is over on, on Hillsdale, that that section, that intersection, that area was technically geographically in the hydraulic CAC. So Supervisor McKeel and I are gonna treat 29 as the boundary. So that will be adjusted to be an RCAC. Um, so all of the Hillsdale and the Greenbrier area there will be in ours. And then um, she'll get a, a, some consideration for um, the school property over on uh, hydraulic that I don't think technically is in the CAC. Um, but those items, if you see that pop up, it'll likely be on a consent agenda just so you know what's going on. Um, oh dear. Yesterday, the board started their strategic plan. We had a retreat all day yesterday out at North Fork. Um, and basically it's step one and what our next strategic plan will be. And we walked through uh, suggested goals. Each board member had a chance to react to it. Um, but that obviously will be ongoing work over the next several months to put our new strategic plan in place. So just calling out that that's kind of the big that and the comp plan update are kind of the two big ticket items that the board uh, will be working on through the rest of the, well, it'll take more than this year, obviously. And then um, just to make a comment about the, um, 
what's being done in J.C. Penney with the police. I do think that it'll increase police activity there. It just will. There's there's less activity there now, period. So now that we have employees going there daily and they're affiliated with police and fire, not to mention that police vehicles throughout the county will find places to be able to link up to networks. You know, the officers in the cars have to be able to link up to uh, a network to be able to do some of the work that they do from the car itself. Obviously, if their own network is in place there, I fully expect that there's going to be some more activity of that. Said that publicly, so it's not to contradict Lance. I mean, the, the folks that are going there, he's right. It's not going to be a police station, but it will be employees of police and fire, and there will be other employees circulating through there. And that circulation, I think, is a good thing for some of the issues that we've seen along Mall uh, in that area. Um, now, that being said, somebody said, well, what does this mean for the rest of the area? Well, I hope this is the first domino that will help spur some redevelopment in that area. The rest of the mall ownership right now, the, the, the fact that some of the owners are mired in bankruptcy and th there's different places, they have no game plan for it. But now on this one section, we have a local property owner. Now he's got an anchor tenant with a, the county, a strong anchor tenant, that that will hopefully start not just help him redevelop the rest of that area with he tends to do uh, employer driven stuff, which is great. But if he brings in other companies that house there and lease the rest of that building out, then that is gonna start getting the attention of what usually builds up around places that have got good anchored employment type places, not just retail operations. So I'm hoping that that will be a domino that will help the rest of that quadrant start to redevelop and the other property owners take notice of it. So can't guarantee any of that. It's out of our control or out of the county's control, but the county has stepped up pretty clearly and said, we're gonna be here for some time and the potential could even be for some growth there, who knows. Um, but that could be the very first domino that says, yep, let's, let's start seeing what the rest of this quadrant can look like and start realizing that vision. And if that starts to happen, then that could uh, activate some of the other things that are in that small area plan as well. So I'm excited for that. I'm thrilled that we were able to get that lease in place. I think staff did an incredible job, not just because of the, uh, how affordable the, this deal has, uh, sets up for us compared to the costs elsewhere. Um, but what it could mean for the Rio 29 area, uh, small area plan. Um, if there are other items you need updates on, uh, provide them if I have them or put them on my list to chase down and follow up. So happy to answer any questions or uh, your comments. Right, let me just say, uh, Audrey, did you have your hand up? You're muted, Audrey. Audrey, you're muted. You're still, you. you're still muted. You're still muted one more time. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, one, um, uh, in regard to the uh, Rio comments and swimming pools and that, um, it, this is for the future. Is it possible that uh, in our environmental plan, we could add things like noise pollution and uh, light pollution to properties that are next to recreational areas or wildlife areas like John Warner Parkway uh, Trail? Um, well, we, number two, just the future when we think about our environmental issues that there might be some uh, lower or stronger standards for light pollution and noise pollution near our wildlife areas. Number two, the water runoff at the city church. I was wondering if you then could help out uh, with uh, resolving that. It sounds to me like the water is coming from the church property, which is in the state, it is in the county. But the issue of managing it seems to be in the city, and there may need some coordination there, a strong coordination. Uh, and number three, um, the, the police station and the hookups to the computer. Uh, right now, the policeman comes into Woodbrook School to hook up and look at his email, and we like that. We like that uh, policeman coming in after dark onto the school. I Some weeks I'm calling five, six times because there's parking problems and people on the school property. Um, and also to follow up on the woods around uh, Woodbrook School that are old and are decaying and trees are falling down. 
Um, I can't find anybody who would help out with the, to see if this is a fire hazard. I've talked to the uh, firemen. They have no assessment or uh, uh, enforcement uh, policies, so it's not theirs. I called the um, code um, uh, department, and they don't have any jurisdiction over how uh, wooded or how much uh, tinder there is there and i called the school last may i called the school this may this june and this july and i haven't heard back for for a year to see if the um, mr rome could walk through the woods with me and uh, he said he would but he hasn't been able to um, there's a tree ready to fall and i'm worried about it there's trenches that kids have built i'm worried about that and i'm worried about the undergrowth although the fire hazard in the east is very different than in the west because we're not as dry. Okay, that's my Thank you. agenda. And you, okay. I'll go in reverse order. You brought that up in the past on the wood piece. So let me, uh, I, I did not follow up on that. So let me. Oh, you asked me to. You were going to handle the traffic and I was going to handle the woods. The so, um, and then school let out on the traffic item, so yeah. that that this is a good time to be bringing that back up. Well, the neighbors are complaining already. People oh, yeah. are running through the traffic. Well, uh, in the um, in the yep, in the school bus delays are still issues with getting it yep, getting yep. the use for that. So and school on, bus drivers got that on the radar. The uh, the point about um, the light pollution, we do have a dark skies ordinance, so things have to meet that in the development area. So uh -huh. you know, like cut off lights and things like that. So, I mean, there there is an ordinance in place for that. The noise thing that David updated on the pool, that, that was news to me. So I'll probably have questions that I'll ask offline on that, just to understand that better. Regulating pool hours and things internal to a site. I don't, I mean, I would imagine other projects have come before us. Um, I just don't remember having discussions about pool hours and other application it's not in from our earlier meeting it's not in the requirement yeah i mean it's not and it's not th i'm thinking of other applications i don't ever re require or remember having discussions about requiring i do agree with david though that that hoas they'll you know the the association the property management companies tend to put those things on specific time frames like i know in dunlora eight o'clock is when the pool closes um, so it's it's governed by whatever the association is for the same reasons that were mentioned. It, the, the noise that may exist off the property will not be enjoyed by those on the property if it's at hours that are unreasonable. Um, so they'll have their own pro management issue on their hand if they allow that to happen. And then the, um, what was the first item? I was going to reverse order and I've forgotten the first. Oh, the, uh, oh, oh, the church item. I'm going to have to get into that one. I would appreciate it. I think that would help the neighbors there and everyone. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me move us along. Ned, thank you very much. I want to say um, to uh, that the Rio Corridor study, I want to really thank you for sponsoring it and really pushing it. And to David, who sort of shepherded it along as well. And if you haven't listened, as Ned said, to the, to the uh, presentation to the board, it's really worth listening to. It was done very well. And, and I, I, think it, I think it's really a good thing for, uh, for the county. So thank you very much. David, yeah, you're, just, you're Nick. Just, okay. just to real quickly, and maybe to uh, feed off of what Mr. Galloway mentioned about this study, and the traffic uh, signal at the Belvedere Rio Road intersection, we have made a, a smart scale grant application for that. And that, um, I confirmed this with Kevin this afternoon, Kevin McDermott, that we had up, have updated that application that so that it does include a request for uh, traffic lights within that green tea. So the application before VDOT, I think they worked with VDOT. There's some technical issues about how that's done for a green tea, but it does include a request for a traffic signal and that application has been made. So I just want to fill you in on that. Okay. So let me see if I can bring the meeting to a close. David, you were gonna make one announcement or you want me to make the list announcement about the uh, AC44 well, round table? 
I'll, I'll just say real quickly, I think we sent uh, all the uh, CAC's information about that. Uh, please, we'd really like for you to attend. That's um, the CC Roundtables. It's titled Planning for Equitable and Resilient Communities. And we want to have a discussion about your big ideas about um, what will go into uh, planning for future development and protection of natural resources, transportation systems, and other uh, the re related topic of the comp plan. I will say that um, it's sort of focused around your big ideas, but the, the staff has drafted some uh, early uh, concepts for big ideas. So there is some information that you can feed off of. It isn't just gonna be an open conversation. There will be some draft big ideas and those were kind of drafted uh, based on the community input we, that they've heard today, commissioned from the feedback. Um, that they've heard in their work sessions with the planning commission today. But again, there's four sites. Um, the next one or the first one's coming up real soon, Monday. And we would like for pre-registration. That way we can tell how much staff we need uh, between the staff and the consultants. Uh, that will be at the county office building at six o'clock and the registration's online. And then it was third, Wednesday, David. Is it Monday or Wednesday? It's Monday, the 29th. Okay. And then Thursday, the 15th, there'll be one at the Yancey Community Gym down in Yancey. And then there, there is a virtual one sep, uh, scheduled for Thursday, September 1st from nice. 7 to 8.30. Okay. And again, we, we like registration in advance. We're not going to turn people away, but if we get advanced registra registration, we'll know how much staff to kind of put to the work because it is a little bit labor intensive. There may be a fourth one, but that's still kind of a work in progress and don't want to announce it since it hasn't been finalized yeah. as yet. I think you'll find it interesting. I went to one of the pop-up sessions and uh, I found it quite interesting. So anybody have any other quick comments? I have one last comment and then, okay. The last comment I have is the next meeting is gonna be in person. So everybody has to dress completely, <laughs> okay? Uh, it'll be I think shoes are required at the county <laughs> office building. It'll be in the office, in the county office building. And it is on September 22nd. And we're meeting at six o'clock. So everybody have a nice time for the rest of the summer. And we'll look forward to seeing you in person. For, and masks are optional. If you want to wear a mask, it's fine. You do not have to. <laughs> and just a real, real quick reminder. Yeah. There are, I believe, five, five or six five or six people that um, their term is up in September. So if you're one of those, I can contact you in person. I, I think some, I think all have been notified, but just remember, um, uh, I can mention names, but I, I think you've all been notified. So I'm just doing a, a quick reminder. Some of you we have not heard from. So the clerk would like to know whether you plan to um, apply again. All right. Okay. Thank you. And good night, everybody. Hey, thanks. Thank you, Marty. Bye.